Liberty, and welcome to our service if you're joining us for the first time. I'd like to take a moment just to point out a few helpful things. During the worship, you'll find a live chat function to the right of your screen if you'd like to interact with other people. Also, during the live broadcast, you can request prayer at the bottom of the screen. And if you'd like to find out more about our church and ways to connect, use the button at the top to find out more about home meetings. Also, I'd like you to consider inviting other people to our worship, even right now at this moment, people who may be shuttered at home for a long period of time and really would benefit from worshiping the Lord together. My name is Mike. I'm going to be leading us as a liturgist today, taking us through the order of worship. Welcome and good morning. Prior to this week, when I thought about the city of Minneapolis, my most vivid emotions and memories centered around Super Bowl 52, when the Eagles hoisted the Lombardi Trophy. Obviously, those emotions have been replaced, and they've been replaced by anger and grief because of the needless and unjust death of George Floyd. This past week, I'd already spent a few sleepless nights thinking about Ahmaud Arbery and Christian Cooper. Those nights became even more magnified after the death of Mr. Floyd. Like many of you today, we are grieving for our nation, and particularly for our African-American brothers and sisters. The other day, I had a chance to catch up with one of my old friends from my medical training. Yasmin is the first African-American female to graduate from the orthopedic residency program at the University of Virginia. In a solemn moment, we reconnected as friends and also grieved together over the events of the past week. As I was thinking about the many black children I take care of in my line of work, I asked her what she wants for her own children and what she says to her sons. I also took pause thinking about the many children that we baptize here in our church. It's not lost in me that as a member of our church, I make a solemn promise at each baptism to support their growth in Christ. These are children of all races. As we gather today, we acknowledge our God who is all-knowing 
and ever present. But in my opinion, we ought not to ignore the emotions that we have felt this past week, the emotions that we have felt in the past, the emotions that we're going to feel for the days and weeks and months to come. And surely we will be continued to be confronted by these emotions in the long-term future. We are confronted because of the ongoing injustices that occur daily in our nation and right here in our city. Later on during the worship, Glenn McDowell will interview Terry Davis, who is another preacher in our city, and they will discuss how the church might respond to these injustices. I encourage you to dwell on these things today and the days to come. Now I invite you to worship the Lord, but I also call on us to cry out to him for mercy and justice and to move us to action so that our black brothers and sisters would be freed from the long-standing injustices and institutional racism that they face on a daily basis. Hear now the call to worship from Acts chapter 2. I invite you to respond by reading the bold text aloud. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in us a fire of your love. Let us pray. Dear God, we come before you this morning to honor you and to worship your name. Holy Spirit, stir our hearts. Give us passion stirred by grace and move us to respond to injustice. Grip our hearts, call us to ache for our nation and, our, and for our African-American friends who live in a different reality day in and day out. Call on your church to stand for justice in the face of mercy. Move us to love those around us and move us closer to those who may look different than us. Indeed, Lord, we acknowledge that we are created equally and beautifully in your image. Together we are one family in your kingdom. As we worship now, call us to grieve and call us to comfort one another as we stand in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you now to join us in songs of praise. Bow thy words so true. 
We will now transition into a time of confession. We will do this by acknowledging our own sin and also acknowledging the hope in the gospel. We will read scripture together, followed by a time of silent confession. Hear these words from Psalm chapter 51, and I invite you to respond together by reading the bold text aloud. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Please take a moment to silently confess your sins. Look up and hear these words of encouragement from Jeremiah chapter 31. No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. He has done this through Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. We will continue now with songs of praise. Oh, my. 
my is blood and forever wash white on the beautiful scandalous night on the beautiful scandalous night on the beautiful scandalous night this is the portion of our service known as passing of the peace. Before you type a message in the chat box or text somebody, take a moment to think about what peace means to you and what it should mean for others in light of the disparities we see in regards to race. When I spoke with my friend Yasmin, she wanted to encourage people to engage with each other. As you share the peace of Christ today, I encourage you to spend some time this week sharing that peace with people who are racially different from you. Peace of Christ, everyone. Hi. From the Matulowitz family, Christine, Ella, Levi, and Justin. We love you, Liberty. Good morning. This is Darnell Bailey. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ, Liberty. From David, Helen, and Eliana. Say hello. Love hey, you, Liberty. Hey, Liberty. Louisa here in Southeast Asia. I miss you. Peace of Christ. Good morning, Liberty. Peace of Christ. Good morning, Liberty family. This is Karen Johnson, also known as Auntie Karen. Peace of Christ. Miss you guys and can't wait to see you again here soon. Peace be with you, Liberty, from Stacy, Izzy, and Leo. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Lead Pastor John Alexander here. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for this worship service. I just have one brief announcement I want to make this morning, and that's a reminder that next Sunday, right after the service, we're going to have our annual congregational meeting, and that'll be online. And what we're going to do leading up to that meeting is uh, on Wednesday or Thursday, I'm going to send out a video that me and a few other leaders in our congregation will put together explaining some things so we won't have to go over everything in the meeting itself. For example, we're going to talk about ways that we anticipate being able to have types of in-person worship gatherings in the weeks and months ahead. We'll share what we think we know and what we don't know and uh, set some expectations in that way. And also, we'll go over some of the finer points of the budget that we're proposing for our new fiscal year that starts July 1. So we're going to put out a video related to these things that'll be 20 to 30 minutes long so that in the congregational meeting we can mainly just talk about and interact on what you've already heard. So you'll have some information going into the meeting if that makes sense. And we'll get that out midweek. The meeting itself will take place about 15 minutes after the service, we're thinking 11.30, but we'll send a link to you in the weekly email with all the specific information you'll need for that. Now I'd like to pass things off to uh, one of our pastors, Glenn McDowell, and also to a friend of mine, Pastor Terry Davis, who pastors Christ Community Church in West Philadelphia. They had an extended conversation, interview style, earlier in the week about how the church can be responding to all that's going on in the wake of George Floyd's murder in Minneapolis early this week, how the church can be responding, how we can interact with other churches in our city that are mourning this event and trying to respond to it. You should know that there's an extended version that's 20 minutes or so that's on our YouTube channel. For the sake of this announcement's time, this is about the second half of this conversation, but I think it'll be clear enough what's being talked about as we drop you in, as we hear from these two leaders in our city. In order for someone in a moment like this to bring value to something like pain in communication, there has to be value for life. And, uh, you know, I, I think Claude Alexander of North Carolina, you know, he laid out a great picture of historical value with how long we've been dealing with racism. And even woven into the DNA of our constitution talks about uh, how the, the African has been devalued. And speaking about the slave, you know, three-fifths human. That means that his humanity really is taken away. And so when you begin to say to me, just as a white person, saying to an African-American off of something that has been just a devastating attack on someone from our race, someone from our culture, 
um, for you to open up by saying, I am so sorry, that says you're bringing value to me and my humanity. You're saying that I matter. And, and the reality is that as a Christian, and whether we're talking about you know, African Americans, whether we're talking about Native Americans, we might be talking about Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, or white Americans, it doesn't matter who it is. If we are going to do the work of unity and really addressing these kinds of, of issues, it must be, I'm, real, I'm willing to say that you are 100% human. Your life matters. Yes. Yes. And that's really the culture of heaven. The culture of heaven is that God is good and, and the cross fixed everything. Uh, there, there's, there's nothing impossible in heaven. And then there's that interesting piece. It says, everyone is significant. Yes. For God so loved the world. And so when you start to talk about what can be done, it must start off with identifying the pain in someone that's valuable. Mm. And so that's one piece. The other part is real communication. It's important mm. for us to communicate. It's important for us to talk and have a table set where we can really talk like we know each other. And that's why I really appreciate um, where where uh, Pastor John is concerned, where you are concerned, where others throughout the city are concerned, that they're willing as believers of different races to come together and do that kind of work. And so uh, at first glance, and I don't wanna take up all this time on this short interview, but I will say, seeing me as a human, regardless of my color, but including my color, um, and then being able to identify with the pain that although it didn't happen to me personally, the way we are wired as a race is that we feel things corporately. Thank you. Uh, uh, Pastor Terry, you've been a leader, you are a leader in our city for bringing together pastors and churches across ethnicities. But now uh, we're at the, a hard place, we're in the pandemic, we're in an election year, uh, so uh, there's political things that amplify divisions between cultures. What does this mean? What, what do you think God is calling the church in Philadelphia to do at, at this time? Well, once again, that's a, that's a good question. It's a relevant question because of all the things that you've listed. We must be careful that we don't allow the influences and the practices of others to govern how we communicate with each other, how we work together with each other. This is so important. And when you come to the table, as I began to mention earlier, we must be able to talk in such a way with, with the kinds of wisdom and discernment from heaven, which means that I want to be careful when I come to talk to you that just and I'm, when I say this, I'm talking about me and you, Glenn, that my first approach isn't who are you going to vote for? Or did you hear what the governor said? Or did you hear what the president said? And trying to find out which side are you on, am I on? Because what that does is it puts a dividing wall automatically up between us. And we can't really have good conversation about closeness. And closeness is needed if we're going to do the work. You see, Glenn, you and I, and again, I'll mention others that are throughout the, the, the city of Philadelphia, we've been working on doing the work. What does that look like? That looks like talking about things that are important to each other in terms of values. Where can we have commonality? So that when a crisis like this does come up, we're not trying to manufacture a relationship right now. There is real relationship because we've done the work. A great example of that is Jamie Centeno. He's a pastor of In the Light Ministries. He's a Hispanic pastor. And so over the years, just like you and I, we've done the work. We've done the work. The hard work of saying, how are you? How is your family? How are you doing? Is there anything I can pray for you on? How's, how's your emotions? How have you been sleeping? Anything going on that I can celebrate with you? 
These things are good and important for building the kinds of healthy relationships that when a crisis comes, we have a platform, we have a foundation to build on. And I will mention, you know, uh, uh, John Alexander, Pastor Alexander, in that same discussion, as we have started last year, building a friendship, being able to see each other weep, and seeing the things that break our hearts so that we can build a closeness so that when we need to stand together as the ecclesia, we can do it with effectiveness. One of the things I, I hope will come out of this crisis we, in, we are in is stronger connections in so many ways, many ways in the body of Christ. I see it happening already. Uh, and just between our two congregations, Liberty and Christ Community Church, uh, I, I lo- would love to see deeper connections. Uh, even though we're not in the same neighborhood, we are in the same city, and more important, we are one in Jesus Christ. So it is such a, a blessing to be one with you, Pastor Terry. Well, I, I am so humbled by that, Glenn. And some of the things that continue to be effective is when those who are in our city can see the church stand together. Not just, uh, you know, that, that passive statement of, yeah, I'll be praying for you this Sunday as you have services, but being creative, being able to show many times out in the streets, us coming together and praying together. And many times, not just the pastors, but let's bring our congregations. Let's show that the value and the strength of us as as God's government agency here on the planet, his church, his ecclesia. We are together and we're not ashamed to let everyone know that we value the same things. We value life. We value the life regardless of the skin color. We value life even from the beginning of inception. We value life. And so it's important for us to to make those kinds of demonstrations so that the world sees. Because he said, Jesus said this, he says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, it's as though the emperor is there. Mm. All of Rome, and that's what Jesus was talking about with that conventos and using that phrase, because in Rome, all you needed was two or three Roman citizens to be able to represent and the emperor was there. Well, as Jesus has come preaching the kingdom, he says, all you need is two or three coming together and heaven's opinion will be established. I believe the difficulty and the hurdle that we have to climb over is us publicly publicly coming together more often so that his conventos can represent heaven's opinion and there'll be a power that will back it up. And I believe from that, just like Jesus's prayer, Father, make them one that the world might believe yes. that you sent me. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Terry. Absolutely. Blessings. Oh, thank you, sir. Scripture reading is from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 through 18. Hear these words from the book that we love. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. 
There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. studying the life of Elijah the prophet, and we've been using a frame as we go through his story passage by passage, and that's uh, the frame of seeing the different spiritual disciplines in his story that are lived out by Elijah or the people around him. For example, we see Elijah observing Sabbath rest. We see Elijah serving others. We see Elijah gathering other people for worship. And today we see Elijah at prayer. Now, as we as a church have kind of organized a, a list of spiritual disciplines as we see them in Scripture, just to remind one another that these are rhythms of the Christian life, we've put them on our website, and we, we refer to these spiritual disciplines as rhythms of grace. And the way we've organized it, uh, we have taken the rhythm of prayer and combined it with the discipline, the rhythm of Scripture reading, and made them one rhythm, one spiritual discipline. Of course they can be separated, but here's why we did that. We put them together because prayer is our voice to God and scripture is God's voice to us and they were meant to be in dialogue with one another. I mean, sure enough, scripture cries out that we respond with our wills, with our prayers, with our voices. So actually in this passage, we see both the voice of man and the voice of God in dialogue, and that's how we're going to work through this text. First, we see the voice of Elijah. Then, we see the responsive voice in God, and we're going to see how they interact, both in his life and in our lives. So, first, the voice of man, the voice of Elijah. In this passage, we hear the voice of Elijah three times. There are three bits of dialogue. 
And the three times, all three times, there's a theme that runs through them all. And the theme is pain. And there's all these emotions that come out of Elijah in response to this pain. And really, the emotions that we see in Elijah aren't unlike the emotions that many of us have felt or heard about in our country this week in response to the murder of George Floyd. But this is the pain that is driving the protests in cities all over the country this weekend. It's the pain that Pastor Terry was referring to in his interview with Glenn. What kind of emotions come out of this pain for Elijah and for us? First, anger. Anger is a common response to pain, certainly for Elijah. Fear. Exhaustion is a word, well, it's definitely there in the life of Elijah. It's a word that was repeated again and again to me uh, from men and women of color that I spoke to this week in the wake of uh, George Floyd's murder. (sighs) Despair is there for Elijah and for many of us. Numbness is there. And this is, I guess it's an emotion. It's in some ways uh, an avoidance of feeling the pain trying to avoid any emotion, but it, it just doesn't tend to last that long, but it's there often. If you need a return to the Elijah story, and if you need to, 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 to be reminded how he ended up right here in this state saying to God, I'd like to die now, please. Here's where we've been. Elijah was in hiding for at least three years because he was the prophet that went to the king, the very wicked king, Uh, who was coordinating Baal worship, the God that demanded child sacrifice and all kinds of other horrors around Israel. Um, Elijah brought the word of God, the word of judgment that says, there will now be a drought that will lead to famine for many years. And then he went into hiding. So of course the king went hunting him and actually other prophets of, of Yahweh, the true and living God of Israel, And after years in hiding, finally there is this showdown moment that we read about last week in 1 Kings 18, where there are two altars, one with the 450 prophets of Baal and another with just Elijah. And the showdown is whose God is going to send out fire on their altar. And of course, Baal being a non-existent God, a demon at best, no God at worst, is silent. And the true and living God sends down fire on his altar. All the prophets of Baal who've shed the blood of the prophets of Yahweh, they're all brought to justice. And the crowds are converted to the faith. And Elijah runs down the mountain. This is right at the end of uh, 1 Kings 18. After the rains come, finally, Elijah runs down the mountain to get to Jezreel, which is where the queen Jezebel is waiting. She wasn't at the mountain. And he waits at the city gate and watches Ahab, who was there, King Ahab, go into the queen and tell her everything that happens. And surely Elijah is thinking, finally, not of the people, not only have the people returned to God, but the king and queen are now going to recognize their misdeeds and their injustices and their idolatry, and they're going to return the whole country to true and proper worship. But instead, they double down on their evil. And Jezebel says, Elijah's a dead man in 24 hours. I don't care who the real God is. I don't care whose side truth is on. Elijah's a dead man in 24 hours. That's the context. So is Elijah afraid here? Sure, he's afraid. But even more, he's in the devastating state of having waited all this time for this showdown moment and everything he could have possibly hoped for happened and the queen remains in denial. And clearly, if the king and queen aren't going to change, they're going to keep facilitating false worship. And his sentiment has to be, all of this was for nothing. And it says in verse 3, he dismissed his servant. You need to read that as, he quits the ministry. He says, I'm not a prophet anymore. Sure, he's afraid, but even more, he's saying, I'm done. Three years in waiting for this, The best of all worlds possible happened in that showdown and still they're not changing. I'm done. Goodbye. Servant, you can can go your own way in Judah. And he goes out in the wilderness. He's on his way on a 40-day journey to Horeb. But in the middle of it, he just lays down and cries out to God and says, God, I want to die. 
I'm not just done the ministry, I'm done with this life. Because if I had to stay in hiding this long and this is all that came of it, what's all this for? Just forget it all. Let it end. This isn't his prayer yet. Here's his prayer. I mean, this is a kind of prayer, but he's really not dealing with what's going on. He's not really bringing it to God. He's like saying, God, I don't want to deal with any of it. I just want to die. But God wants him to deal with it. God wants him to open his heart and open his mouth and lift up his voice in prayer and actually offer to him his experience so God can interact with it. So God feeds him miraculously for the third time in the Elijah narrative gets him to Horeb, a 40-day journey away in the wilderness of Arabia. Elijah takes up residence in a cave, and that's when the voice of God comes for him saying, in a question, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, I think I've said this before, but any time in scripture when God is asking a question, God is not the one asking for information. God doesn't need information. He didn't need it when he asked the first question in scripture to Adam and Eve, where are you? He didn't need that information in the person of Jesus on Easter Sunday when he asks Mary Magdalene, why are you crying? And he doesn't need the information here. When God asks a question, he's asking it because you need information, because you need to be invited to have the conversation you should be and always have access to be having. What's going on, Elijah? And then it all comes out. Oh, these people, they're idolaters. They tore down the true altars. They did wicked things. The king and the queen are awful. Oh, oh yeah, I've been hunted every day for three and a half years, except for one day. And it was a great day, don't get me wrong, but it was one day. And now they're looking for my life again. And I just, I'm done. This is going to shock some of you. But did you know that you can walk in anxiety, bitterness, shame, outrage, exhaustion, whatever your emotions are that are overwhelming to you, you can walk in these emotions for a really long time and never talk about them. Or maybe you could talk about them. You can offer them out to people who who maybe even are good listeners, but you're not offering them up so that they can come to and against something true and honest and compassionate and steady and welcoming. And that thing is the voice of God. Elijah's prayer is immediately met with the voice of God. And that's the second point. Interestingly enough, in this passage, God actually shows Elijah the significance of his voice before he actually gives him words of instruction. And here's what I mean. This is, this is that crazy episode about the earthquake, the fire, and the wind, and then the, the whispery voice that comes to Elijah. What's that all about? Well, so here's what God does. He says to Elijah, look, come on out of the cave. Elijah doesn't, it turns out right away. He stays back. It, it's not until the, the storm uh, passes by that he comes out. God says, come on out. And it says, God passed by. And there was heavy wind, but God wasn't in the wind. Then there was an earthquake that clearly God brought, but it says God was not in the earthquake. Then a fire came, but it says God was not in the fire. But then at the end of verse 12, it says, after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. The implication being, God brought all those other things about, but he wasn't in them. He was really in the whisper. In some way, the whisper is the consummate communication in all of this revelation happening before Elijah. What in the world does all this mean? Well, you need to remember that God has actually, in Scripture so far, and will again, reveal himself many times through earthquakes and fire. I mean, it just happened in the last chapter, God revealed himself in fire. It happens in the burning bush with Moses. It, um, God often, it actually, the mountain that Elijah is on has another name besides Horeb. It's Mount Sinai. The last time we were at Mount Sinai was when God made that first covenant with the nation of Israel. And he revealed himself, yes, by giving the law, 
but also through earthquakes and fire and loud, unpleasant, intense noises communicating his ferocity, his power. He does reveal himself through these things. But in some way, he's saying, Elijah, what you really need is the whisper. What does this mean? Well, what does the whisper have that all those other things don't? You know, if you were a mile away, you could see the windstorm breaking rocks apart. You could see the fire. You could see and feel the earthquake. You couldn't hear the whisper, though. In the whisper, there's communication on an intimate level. All the other things say, watch out, I'm strong, and be careful. And those things are true enough of God. The whisper says, I want us to be close, though. And that's really where communion happens. That's where communion happens. It's through words, word revelation, that God most clearly expresses himself. It's certainly the way that we receive salvation by hearing the news of the gospel of the Son of God who came in the flesh to take our place, to be our our saving king, but the road of that saving king went through a cross so that he could forgive all of our sins through the atoning sacrifice of his own perfect life laid down for our sins so we could be set free from judgment That's news that needs to be heard. And this has always been the way. Real communion with God happens through conversations. So what's all being communicated to Elijah here? It seems like God is saying to Elijah, you know, in all the chaos of your life, and it has been chaotic, it's been terrible. In all of that, you know what happened, Elijah? You forgot that in the midst of all of that, I still tend to you just like this. I still tend to you just like this. I'm greater than anything you can imagine in this world, anything you can imagine in our universe. He is greater than the sun that could contain a million earths, and he's closer to you than your breath. And the closeness to you is where communion happens. And Elijah had lost it. God invites it back before he actually gives him any instruction. He says, I want this. And Elijah had it, and you and I have it too. We do. How do I know? I know because of Jesus. Do you know the story in Matthew, Mark, and Luke of the transfiguration, as it's so called? It's the story, it's right in the middle of those first three Gospels. When Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain, he's transfigured before them in such a way that his his divinity shines through so that they can see, okay, this man is really a man, but he's also really God. And his voice and the voice of God come together in Jesus Christ. And interestingly enough, in that moment, Moses and Elijah appear. Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus. Moses and Elijah, the two men in the history of the world who got closest to communion with God, both on a mountain, both though had to kind of be sheltered in a cave of the mountain so that the intensity of God could pass by so that they could have some kind of gentler communication with him. What does all this mean? In some way, this was the moment when the disciples realized that Christ comes to bring God and man together in such a way that Moses and Elijah never even experienced. They got closer than anybody else. But in Jesus, something new is happening. Something greater is happening in terms of communication between the voice of God and the voice of man. It's actually, in Luke's gospel, it's clearest On the way down the mountain, the gospel writer Luke says, Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. In other words, he knew on the way down that mountain after the transfiguration, he knew that he had to go straight to the cross because it's at the cross where his unique sacrifice 
could bridge that gap between God and man, could bring man near an intensely holy God despite our sinfulness because he is the unique God-man who could provide atonement for our sins, bridging the gap, bringing back full communion that was lost all the way back in the garden. What does all that mean for your prayer? Here's what it means. Everything gets through. Everything you say gets through to God. Every syllable gets through to him. You have total and complete unfettered access because of Jesus. And I want you to have that confidence. Everything gets through. Even, I mean, Elijah, for his part, he's got a little exaggeration here. He says, you know, they killed all the prophets and I'm the only one left. It's like, you know, there was, you know, other prophets that you met who had survived by God's grace just last chapter. It's really bad, Elijah. I get it. But he wants you to bring your experience to him. Even if in Elijah's case, it's exaggerated. He wants you to bring all of your experience with your voice to all that he's made known of himself in his voice. That is a dialogue that he is eager to have with you. Just bring it. You don't have to wait 40 days on the way to a mountain in Arabia. You can bring it to him now. How does he answer, though? I want to end on that point, because, you know... In Elijah's case, very clear answers come through, and it does lead to action. That's how the passage ends after God says, hey, you know I'm here for you still, right? This is how it works. He actually gives Elijah very clear instruction. He says, look, there's going to be a new dynasty. Injustice is going to be dealt with. It's not going to be immediate or perfect yet, but it's coming. You're going to multiply your ministry in another po- into other prophets. I need you to do that. There's going to be a guy named Elisha. God calls him back into ministry. God makes his will known in response to Elijah's prayer. Do you ever wish you could like open up to, well, I, I'll say, John Alexander chapter 1, verse 17, where God tells me what to do as a pastor on Friday when the world is rightly on fire because a young black man was was killed in custody of law enforcement um, officials that have a, a job to protect them. And it seems to happen with really troubling regularity. What do, what do, what do I do? What do you do? What are we called to? You know, on the note of prayer, there's been a lot of criticism to Christians who say, I'm going to pray about that in response. And that's it. Because prayer shouldn't be the end. Actually, that's true. It must, it cannot be absent. Prayer cannot be absent. But God does call his people to act. He gives Elijah exact instructions. And with us, it might not be as exact, but we do have ways that our voice meeting God's leads to action and blessing in the world. I was reading through 2 Timothy, which I've been feasting on. I don't know if you've ever read that letter, um, but I invite you to. I think we'll probably do a sermon series on it. 2 Timothy. It's a letter from Paul to a young pastor starting out in Ephesus. And uh, there's this amazing line that I think I'd read many times before, but it really grabbed me this, this week. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, I want you to know in your pastoral ministry that God has saved us and called us to a holy calling, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. You know what that means? That means God planned to save you who are being saved, but he also, from ages past, planned for you to do stuff that uniquely you and I can do in his kingdom. And just knowing that that's a plan helps me pray for it. Helps me take my voice up to his voice in all of my experience, 
into all of what he's made known about himself and his word and say, Lord, what now, May 31st, 2020? What now? And I got to tell you, I'm getting some answers. I think he will too. Yes, you need to pray. What is he requiring of you? Let me tell you what I'm hearing. In the midst of all this, in prayer today, talking with many of you, praying with many of you, I realized, you know, one of the really interesting things that's happened during this pandemic is I've really solidified stronger relationships with uh, a diverse group of pastors in our city. Those relationships were there, but they've really grown. And the other thing that's happening, every week I'm distributing meals next to police officers. And not just any police officers, the community relations officers in our police district. There's an intersection there when you look at the concern of the world, and that's personal for me, perhaps. I'm a pastor. I'm working alongside police officers whose main work is interacting with community members. And there is a conversation in our nation about men of color in particular who regularly are experiencing this injustice and feel like they have a target on their back and they're not crazy. What does that mean for me? I'm living into how God set the table and my eyes were just open to it in prayer and through conversation with many of you. And I know that's very personal. I just want you to expect as you lift up your experience and come up against his beautiful, holy, steady, welcoming word that he's not going to fail to show you how to act and show us how to act. Liberty, may we ever bring all that we are experiencing into conversation with all that we know of him. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Brothers and sisters, I have this prayer of longing for communion while we continue to wait to gather together in a way that we can can receive communion. And I'll invite you once again to respond with me as I read it for us. Gracious God, we long for the day we can receive communion again. And even more for the day when we, along with the whole company of Christ, may sit and eat in your kingdom While we wait, please strengthen us by the Holy Spirit that we may be ever more sanctified to enter the fullness of your life and love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing a song of response. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my God. Against deceitful man, oh, deliver us. For you are the God, who might take refuge. Why have you rejected me? I walk around confused. Send out your light and truth and the peace. Bring me your will to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar, God, to God my exceeding joy. Oh, you are the God, you're my day.
take refuge Why have you rejected me? I walk around confused Send out your love and truth Let them lead me Bring me to your holy To your dwelling And I'm going to the altar of God challenging times in our nation and even challenging times for your church. We lean into you for not just the power to lay hands on the sick, but that same power to come with discernment where we can try the spirit in this time. Where we won't receive the spirit of rage and bitterness we'll receive the spirit of wisdom. Give us conversations. May we sit at the table and value one another where everyone matters. Every person you have created, Lord, is 100% human, not partial human, and the other part animal. We all matter. Will you fill us all with this? May you bring out in your holy, sacred scriptures those who read what love looks like. May they then come with the corresponding actions. Bring us together on this, Lord. Give us the strategy of heaven, Holy Spirit, that we model the love of Jesus. Show us how to do justice. Show us how to love mercy and show us how to walk humbly before you, Lord. May your ecclesia arise during this time and cut the head off of that spirit of racism and division. Not just race to race, but even within races. May we model what the Father and the Son looks like, that the world may believe that you sent Jesus. Fill us, Father. Cause us to dream again. We pray for these families who have lost their family members. Heal their hearts. Heal their hearts. Even those who have watched these scenarios and they're reminded of things that were done to them and done to their families. Heal their hearts 
Holy Spirit. We come representing your body, Jesus. Ambassadors of heaven, send your power, Father. We, pay, we pray, Father, for those who have perpetrated these acts of violence and these atrocities. We pray, Father, that you rescue them from the dark blindness of the enemy. Open their eyes to see. May they see your way. May they value all lives. Bring healing to our land. Bring the kind of revival we pray, Father, that will change some laws, some actions, some perspectives. Bring that kind of revival, Lord. The kind that brings transformation. We love you so much. And we see, Lord, our heart has not been so affected. Our heart has not been so diseased with disappointment in these matters that we stop dreaming. Oh, Lord, we are still dreaming. We're dreaming, Lord, for a great deliverance to come by your goodness, to come by your church. Thank you for being with us and for us. We commit ourselves to you fresh in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is the part of our worship service where the worshiping community shares some of what God has given each of us to steward financially. And if you're not in the practice of sharing financially with the local church, uh, pray about it. There's a link on the screen, and we're going to sing a final song as we conclude the worship service for this morning. Reckon 
size, partner, what's our year? Use me for this child, I can no longer fear. The confidence I now draw me. Confidence I now draw nigh. Father, I but father. Folks, there's a ton going on in our world this week. We need to pray. Just wanted to remind you that every Monday at 11 a.m. we have an open prayer meeting, and I'll repost the link to that to our Facebook page today. A reminder that every week we have a companion YouTube video uh, submitted by Carol Davis to help us live out these spiritual practices day in and day out. And also, while you're on that YouTube channel, please watch that interview in full between Glenn and Terry. I think it'll aid your prayers uh, for our country in the week ahead. But for now, I'd like to pronounce a final benediction on you all. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace and serve the Lord.